Welcome to Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, offering biblical guidelines, principles of the kingdom of heaven that will help you stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and reap the benefits that accompany you as a citizen of the kingdom. The best the king has to offer. Today's topic, living the kingdom compliant lifestyle. You've probably heard me define kingdom compliance several times in my previous podcasts, but in this episode, it is the main topic of discussion. My definition of kingdom compliance is strict adherence to the word of God, conformity to the king's ethical and moral standard of righteousness, as opposed to conformity to the evil systems of the world. In other words, the kingdom compliant saint is willing to comply, yield, surrender, become submissive and pliable, compatible with the guidelines, rules and laws, the principles of the kingdom of heaven. The true way into the kingdom of heaven is to do things God's way, and God's ways are based on righteousness and truth. A description of the righteousness of God can be found in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Truth, as ascribed to God's word, can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 14 through 19, where Jesus prays to God, for those believers who followed him, and for subsequent believers who would believe on the disciples' word. Let's read that. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Toward the end of Apostle John's life, he gives this testimony in 3 John verses 3 and 4. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. I believe Psalm 15 provides an excellent description of the life that pleases God. This is a Psalm of David, a man after God's own heart. This is a Psalm of humility before God because it describes the characteristics of the godly. A godly person will uphold righteousness even to his own hurt. He keeps his word even when it is not to his advantage. A godly person is never moved from his walk of righteousness and truth because he or she has learned the secret of abiding in God, in his word. No trouble will be able to move him or her out of that sheltering presence. Let's take a look at Psalm 15. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness, and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not bite bite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. I like that. Walking in the truth of the word of God, living the principles of the kingdom, 
living the kingdom and compliant lifestyle. It cleanses born-again believers from wrong thoughts. Sometimes we are tempted to think critical of others. God's word can prevent this. On other occasions, fearful thoughts may race through our minds. However, the word of God will prevent this also. In fact, the word of God will establish our total thought life if we but allow it to do so. Living the kingdom compliant lifestyle also cleanses us from wrong words. The Apostle James seems to be God's expert on the sins of the human tongue. In the first chapter of his epistle, he deals with this very thing and shows the absolute necessity of dependence upon the word of God to keep our words true. Furthermore, living a lifestyle of righteousness and truth cleanses us from wrong actions. Jesus promised us this would be the case. He said in John 15, 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The word of God in the life of the born again believer should demonstrate the moral nature of God's holiness. Torah is the Hebrew word translated to our English word for law, which means a precept or statute, the Decalogue or Pentateuch, guidance, teaching, instruction, doctrine. In Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through 11, several synonyms occur stating characteristics of the law. These indicate the godliness that is intended to result from God's revelation. His work is converting. It changes and saves. His revelation is clean, cleansing the human spirit from sin. Let's take a look at that. Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. The word of God is of much greater benefit to us than day or night, than the air we breathe or the light of the sun. To recover man out of his fallen state, there is need of the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, meaning it teaches us true religion, not man-made religion. The whole law is perfect. Its tendency is to convert or turn the soul from sin and the world to God and holiness. It shows our sinfulness and misery in departing from God and the necessity, rather, of our return to him. This testimony is sure to be fully dependent on. The ignorant and unlearned that will but believe what God's word says become wise unto salvation. It is a sure direction in the way of duty. It is a sure foundation of living comforts and a sure foundation of lasting hopes. The statutes of the Lord are right, just as they should be. And because they are right, they rejoice the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, holy, just, and good. By them, we discover our need of a Savior and then learn how to adorn his gospel. They are the means which the Holy Spirit uses in enlightening the eyes. They bring us to a sight and sense of our sin and misery and direct us in the way of duty. The fear of the Lord, that is, true religion and godliness, is clean. It will cleanse our way, and it endures forever. The ceremonial law is long since done away, but the law concerning the fear of God is forever the same. The judgments of the Lord, his precepts are true. They are righteous altogether. There is no unrighteousness in any of them. Gold is for the body other earthly uses as well, and the concerns of time, but grace is for the soul. 
in the concerns of eternity. The word of God received by faith is more precious than gold. It is sweet to the soul, sweeter than honey. The pleasure of the flesh indulges itself excessively, yet is never satisfied. But the pleasures of the kingdom are substantial and satisfying. There is no danger of excess. God's word warns the wicked not to go on in his wicked way and warns the righteous not to turn from his good way. There is a reward, not only after keeping, but in keeping God's commandments. God's word is based upon righteousness and truth and is the source of our spiritual life and growth. The Apostle James brings enlightenment to the subject of not only being a hearer of the word of God, but also a doer of the word of God. James chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Amen. A true Christian becomes as different a person from what he was before the renewing influences of divine grace, as if he were formed over again. We should devote all of our faculties to God's service, that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Instead of blaming God under our trials, we should open our ears and hearts to learn what God is teaching us by our trials. And if we would allow Holy Spirit to govern our tongues, we would more easily govern our passions. The worst thing we can bring to any dispute is anger. Here is an exhortation to lay apart and to cast off as a filthy garment all sinful practices. This reaches to sins of thought and affection, as well as of speech and practice, to everything corrupt and sinful. We must yield ourselves to the Word of God with humble and teachable minds being willing to hear of our faults, taking it not only patiently, but thankfully. The word of God is designed to make us wise to salvation. To those who shun the word of God, you dishonor the gospel of the kingdom. And watch this, you disappoint your own soul. But if we heard a sermon every day of the week, and an angel from heaven were the preacher, yet if we rested in hearing only, it would never bring us to heaven. Mere hearers are self-deceivers, and self-deceit is the worst deceit of all. If we flatter ourselves, it is our own fault. The truth as it is in Jesus flatters no man. Let the word of truth be carefully attended to, and it will set before us the corruption of our nature, the disorders of our hearts and lives, and it will tell us plainly what we are. Our sins are the spots the law discovers as we examine ourselves in alignment with the word of God. But in vain do we hear God's word and look into the gospel glass if we go away and forget our spots instead of washing them off and forget our remedy instead of applying to it. This is the case with those who do not hear the word as they ought. When we hear the word with our spiritual ears, we look into it for counsel and direction. And when we study it, it turns to our spiritual life. Those who are committed to the word of God are and shall be blessed in all their ways. God's divine favor is connected with his present peace and comfort. Every part of divine revelation has its use in bringing the sinner to Christ for salvation and in directing and encouraging him to walk at liberty by the spirit of adoption according to the holy commands of God. It is not for a person's deeds that he or she is blessed, but in their deed. It is not talking but walking. You can't just talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. This will bring you into heaven. Christ will become more precious to the believer's soul, which by his grace will become more fitted 
for the inheritance of the saints in light. Many born-again believers fail to live the kingdom-compliant lifestyle because they allow the pressures of the devil, the world, and their flesh to assail them or attack them with harsh and violent thoughts, acts, and deeds. First, how does the devil accomplish this? Well, he attacks our thought life, filling our minds with situations, circumstances, and dilemmas that we agree with but are not in alignment with the word of God. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Spiritual strength and courage are needed for our spiritual warfare and suffering. Those who would prove themselves to have true grace must aim at all grace and put on the whole armor of God, which he prepares and bestows. The Christian armor is made to be worn, and there is no putting off our armor until we have finished our warfare and completed our course. The nature of our warfare is not only against human enemies, nor against our own corrupt nature, but we also deal with an enemy who has a thousand ways of beguiling unstable souls. The devil assaults us in our soul, our mind, will, emotions, and intellect, where he labors to change the heavenly image in our hearts. We must resolve to stand by God's grace and not to yield to Satan. We must submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. But if we give way to his deception, he will gain ground. If we distrust either our cause or our leader, or our armor, we give the devil the advantage. The different parts of the armor God has given us to sustain the fiercest assaults of the enemy are described in the scripture text we just read. But notice there is no armor for the back. In other words, there is nothing to defend those who turn back in the Christian warfare. Truth girds on all the other pieces of our armor and is mentioned first. The righteousness of Christ imputed to us is a breastplate against the arrows of divine wrath. The righteousness of Christ implanted in us fortifies our heart against the attacks of Satan. Faith is all in all an hour of temptation. Faith as relying on unseen objects, receiving Christ and the benefits of redemption, and so deriving grace from him is like a shield, a defense in every way. The devil is the wicked one. Violent temptations by which the soul is set on fire of hell or darts Satan shoots at us. But faith applied to the word of God and the grace of Christ quenches the darts of temptation. Salvation must be our helmet. As such, it purifies our soul and keeps it from being defiled by Satan. Our weapon of attack is the word of God, the sword of the spirit. It subdues and mortifies evil desires and blasphemous thoughts as they rise within. And it answers unbelief and error as they assault from without. And finally, prayer must fasten all the other parts of our Christian armor together. We must commit to consistent prayer. We must pray with all kinds of prayer, public, private, secret. <laughs> and we must persevere in particular requests, notwithstanding discouragements. We must pray not for ourselves only, but for all saints, knowing that our Redeemer is almighty and that we are strong in the power of his might. Our problem with the world is that we love it more than we love God. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 tells us why the world is an enemy of our living a spiritual lifestyle in compliance with the kingdom of heaven. Verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. The things of the world may be desired and possessed for the uses and purposes which God intended, and they are to be used by his grace and to his glory. But believers must not seek to value them for those purposes to which sin abuses them. The world draws the heart from God, and the more the love of the world prevails, the more the love of God decays. The things of the world are classed according to the three ruling inclinations of depraved nature. Number one, the lust of the flesh, of the body. Wrong desires of the heart. That's what those are. The appetite of indulging all things that excite and inflame sensual pleasures. The lust of the flesh. Then number two, the lust of the eyes. The eyes are delighted with riches and rich possessions. This is the lust of covetousness or greed. And then number three, the pride of life. A vain man craves the grandeur and pomp of a vain glorious life. This includes thirst after honor and applause. Now, the things of this world quickly fade and die away. That's the word of God. Desire itself will eventually fail and cease, but holy affection is not like the lust that passes away. The love of God shall never fail. Many vain efforts have been made to evade the force of this passage by limitations, distinctions, or exceptions. Many have tried to show how far we may be carnally minded and love the world, but the plain meaning of these verses cannot easily be mistaken. Unless this victory over the world is begun in the heart, a man has no root in himself, but will fall away, or at best remain an unfruitful saint. Yet these vanities are so alluring to the corruption in our hearts that without constant watching and prayer, we cannot escape the world or obtain victory over the God and prince of it, Satan. Then there is the flesh to contend with. Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 26 contrasts the nature of the flesh and the nature of the spirit. Let's read it. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. If we are sincere and dedicated to act under the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit, though we may not be freed from the stirrings and oppositions of the corrupt nature which remains in us, it shall not have dominion over us. We are engaged in a conflict in which we earnestly desire that grace will obtain full and speedy victory. And those of us who give ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit are not under the law as a covenant of works, nor exposed to its curse. No, our hatred of sin and desire for holiness show that we have a part in the salvation of the gospel. The works of the flesh are many, <laughs> and they're manifest. And these sins will shut men out of heaven's best. Yet, how many born-again believers do you suppose live according to their flesh and say they hope for heaven? The fruit of the Spirit, or of the renewed nature, which we are to characterize, are named. And as Apostle Paul named the works of the flesh as not only hurtful to men, but also tending to make them hurtful to one another, so also he purposefully magnifies the fruit of the Spirit, which tend to make Christians agreeable to one another as well as to make them happy. 
The fruit of the Spirit operating in the lifestyle of the born-again believer plainly show that those persons are led by the Spirit. By describing the works of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit, we are told what to avoid and oppose and what we are to cherish and cultivate. And this should be the sincere care and endeavor of all true Christians. Sin no longer reigns in our mortal bodies so that we obey it, for we seek to destroy it. Christ never will own those who yield themselves up to be servants of sin. And it is not enough that we cease to do evil, but we must learn to do well. Our conversation will always be answerable to the principle which guides and governs us according to Romans 8 and 5, which read, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. We must set ourselves in earnest to mortify the deeds of the body and to walk in newness of life, not being desirous of vain glory or unduly wishing for the esteem and applause of men not provoking or envying one another, but seeking to bring forth more abundantly those good fruits which are, through Jesus Christ, to the praise and glory of God. What then is our goal as born-again believers who live the kingdom-compliant lifestyle? It is to demonstrate God's grace and to glorify Jesus Christ on earth. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Wow. And 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 11 gives us the conclusion of the whole matter of living the kingdom compliant lifestyle. 1 Peter 4 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. If you would like to refer this episode to others, click on share and subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date when new episodes drop. Thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. I hope you join me next time for Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, where we stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven.